my patient was a 70 year male hypertensive diabetic severe bilateral osteoarthritis of the knee and he also presented with the exertional dyspnea uh, it was borderline angina equivalent like situation patient used to have a very uncontrolled diabetes it was 8.5 percent most of the time and he consulted a physician and the physician advised a ct angio and CT showed borderline lesion both in OM1 and LAD. In fact, LAD had a lesion in mid uh, middle part and the proximal part. And then he came uh, for the opinion and then we decided that let us uh, see what is uh, there in the coronaries and the, whether the lesion leads treatment or not. So these are the CT images of the patient. And if you see the middle lesion where you have a lot of calcium, which is concentric in almost around 5 mm, uh, calcific lesion was noted and the proximal lesion in the LED which was again we had a pictures and we re-evaluated. So area stenosis almost uh, the middle part was 35 percent but it was because of calcium it was not evaluated properly. The proximal part had a area stenosis of 70 percent as per the CT criteria and look going deep into the morphology uh, for the high risk uh, plaque uh, the proximal lesion If you see the proximal lesion, you have a spotty calcium which was noted somewhere here and you have a low attenuation plaque uh, also present in the proximal lesion. Of course the middle lesion because of calcium uh, we have a distorted image and we were not able to identify that and on that plot I think we planned that uh, the osteal uh, OM lesion as a borderline again. It has a spotty calcium which was noted. So we thought we evaluated uh, the lesion first with the uh, FFR and then if required we do intervention. So uh, this was a lab dominant system uh, else OM1 is a borderline lesion. The middle ED had a borderline lesion. In fact um, compared to uh, CT if you see the middle part it was not that significantly looking. Of course the proximal part was reported on CT was 70% was and it was almost matching and we planned for the FFR and on FFR the first we did the RFR which was 0 0.90 and as per the criteria it was negative 0.89 it was there. We thought we evaluated and then we evaluated the lesion with the intracoronary adenosine and with the intracoronary adenosine we had a FFR of 0.79 was in fact positive but again we thought it's still a borderline uh, not very convincing and let us do uh, IV adenosine uh, to this part. So we thought uh, that we not only do the IV adenosine and we also do a pullback and we selected a site and uh, we will see the separately the distal part and the proximal part and then uh, plan the strategy if it, all, if it is needed. So this was a pullback from the distal part and the FFR jump was 0.7, it was 0 0.70 and uh, with the pullback it was uh, uh, it was 0 0.79 and with the pullback it was uh, 0 0.70 and in the proximal part uh, the FFR jump or the delta was 0 0.16. So we have a big delta jump which was noted in the proximal lesion compared to the distal lesion. So we planned for the intervention, uh, both the lesions uh, look significant. The first lesion, IC and IV both had a FFR which was beyond the number, specific number which was 0 0.80. So both the lesions need a treatment for the execution. We thought that uh, we should do uh, image guided interventions to optimize the post uh, strengthening uh, part. So FFR was again done uh, and on FFR what we had was a distant landing uh, zone diameter was around 3.3, the proximal part has a diameter of around 4. Uh, the tightest part uh, which was uh, spotty on CT NGO had a MLO of around 3.3 uh, and it was also matching as per the various criteria. In non-LMCA we know that uh, there are various criteria, some say 3.5, 3.33, 2.75 but it was almost nearby to that criteria. But the proximal part, uh, the proximal lesion is a ML of 5.10 and this was a run and this was a portion where we see a calcium but it was again on CT shed uh, it was less than 5 mm. Here also it was less than 5 mm in length 
this was the proximal landing zone for this uh, distal lesion and the proximal lesion as a fibrolipidic part and the calcium which was noted almost at uh, 10 to 2 o'clock hour. So for a distal lesion, we have a calcium length of less than 5, the lesion length was around 36, the plaque burden was 80%. For the proximal part, uh, we have a more of a fibrolipidic plaque with a calcium at 10 to 2 o'clock, lesion length was around 20, and the plaque burden was 60. But the MLA wise, uh, the distal lesion was matching, but the proximal lesion was not matching. So we have CT, we have FFR, we have IS. So for distal lesion, FFR and IVAS both are concordant. In fact, the CT under-evaluated because probably because of calcium, the, uh, the area uh, which were reported uh, were not adequate. And the pro proximal lesion, FFR was positive. The MLA criteria, if you apply for the IVAS, it was slightly discordant. But if you look at the plaque morphology which we had with the CT, and we correlate and go with the high uh, plaque uh, criteria, it was matching. It was having a spotty calcium on CT, it was having uh, a fibrolipidic component and FFR which was positive because the delta jump was quite high. So for non-LMCA lesion, this was uh, almost a confusion. So what the literature says, that the literature says that if you have ML of more than 4.4 and FFR of 0.8, it is a strong negative predictive value and we all agree to that part. But the lesion who had ML of 4 with FFR of less than 8 or a vice versa, I think the relationship is not that uh, clear. The lesion length, MLA, lesion location, they are the independent predictor of FFR and the plaque volume, plaque area uh, uh, of the uh, area of the plaque also plays important role and they are inversely related to the FFR. So we thought that we should treat both the lesions uh, we prepared the lesion uh, with the angiosculpt. The proximal lesion was prepared with the 3.5 mm balloon and rest of the part because technically the lesions were not that tricky as far as the intervention part is concerned. It was more of a difficult part was the decision making. Uh, we stented the lesion, the middle part was 3 by 38 and the proximal part was 3.5 by 23. Optimized the distal stent with 3, uh, the proximal stent with the 4 by 8 mm balloon and we again had a post procedure IVAS and on post procedure what we had is a under expansion of the calcific part which was noted on CT. Uh, of course we had an area of 5.05 in that region and in the proximal part we had an area of 7.78 quite satisfactory area but still it needed a uh, treatment this was a zone of under expansion uh, which was corrected and after the correction, we had a area of 5.65 in that region. The stent was well expanded and so is the proximal part of the stent. The proximal LED had an area of around 8.8 after the correction. Importantly, we did the procedure on the FFR wire and uh, the FFR post procedure was uh, 0.98. So it was quite uh, uh, interesting that uh, the both the lesion treatment has improved the uh, FFR and the lesion become uh, almost non ischemic criteria wise. The OM lesion was again FFR was done and the FFR was 0.99 it was negative. We deferred the intervention in that part we have not done the I was on that lesion. So the conclusion was determining whether an intermediate coronary lesion is associated with the ischemia poses a great clinical uh, dilemma. Elective PCI should not be performed based on the angiography alone and without demonstration of ischemia. FFR, IFR, both are recommended. Uh, in 24% of the patient, what Dr. Manoj was highlighting was we do intervention and still the residual ischemia persists and then the post-procedure uh, FFR should be done in most of the patients. They are complementary. We know the limitation of FFR and IVAS and in certain lesions, I think both the modalities uh, should be included. FFR guides us whether the lesions need treatment or not and uh, IVAS will uh, give uh, important as far as the preparation of the lesion, stenting size and the post stenting uh, whether uh, it needs modification or not. So both the modalities have shown its influence on the patient outcome. So certain lesions needs both the modality and on, on top of that also we need extra non-invasive investigation that also plays a vital role in deciding uh, to for the treatment upon the, upon the best outcome of the patient. Thank you.